The capacitors are here for the old Zenith stereo. Welcome to Hack a Week. Let's see what we got. I got these from uh, Allied Electronics. I searched around on the internet and found these guys, Allied Electronics. They're great. In fact, I made a little mistake on the order and um, I duplicated an order. Uh, and uh, long story short, I called them up and had to cancel one order and get credit on it. And it was a no brainer. They were great. It was over the phone I did it and they took care of it and shipped everything out that day. and. They just arrived yesterday and it's really neat because all of the capacitors are packaged in their own little bubble wrap and on the front it tells uh, tells me what uh, capacitor is what these are the uh, 0.1 microfarad capacitors and they're really tiny compared to uh, the capacitors that are in here um, let's see let me give you a for instance like that one right there that's a 0.47 microfarad. Let's see if I can find that one here somewhere. Um, there's the 4700 picofarad. There's the 0 0.047. And let's see, there's the 0.7 right there. So that one is a 0.7 microfarad old school paper cap. And then this is the new one. Look how tiny. Look at the difference. It's like, wow, way smaller. So they're going to fit in here just fine. So what I'm gonna do now is just basically get to work pulling out um, one at a time and replacing them as I go. And uh, you get to follow along and watch me uh, solder them up. I'm not gonna go through every single one. I'm just gonna show you the basics of how I'm gonna go in there and pull them off and solder in a new one. Let's get started. I'm gonna start out with the 0 0.01 microfarad caps. I've got one right here. One end of this goes to a ground right on the chassis, so that's probably going to really suck up the heat. I'm going to have to get that um, soldering iron on there and let it sit for a while. And a little trick is to feed a little bit of solder on there, some fresh stuff. I'm sure the ratio of tin to lead on my new stuff versus this old stuff is a little bit different. So get this nice and warm. and. There's a couple of ways I could do this. I could just clip the lead, warm it up, and poke the new one back through. Um, I like to try to get the old wire off if I can, but this one is really gonna eat up the heat, so it's gonna be a little bit tricky because I'm, I'm virtually trying to solder right to a, a heat sink. Okay, I've got the wire straightened out. There's a little loop there. Okay, there we go. Got that pulled out. Now what I'm going to do is just poke a lead right through that terminal, if I can, with the new cap. I'm just kind of wiggle it around here until we find where that little hole is. There it is. It went through. And uh, just run in enough. Like right about there. Okay. And now we'll clip a little bit of that extra lead back. And then take the tiny needle nose and get in there and take out that little leftover piece. I'll take that little piece that's still there and bend it around. Now let's get the uh, soldering iron back on there. I've cranked my heat up to about 800 degrees Fahrenheit just to have the overhead of that much more heat coming into the process here. And we'll just start feeding in a little bit of some solder here to get that really soldered up well. All right, that takes care of the ground side. Now that's a non-polarized cap, so I didn't really have to worry about which way it goes in. And now the other end is over here. 
Now this one should be a little easier because it's just on an open terminal that isn't going to ground or a big heat sink source. So this one shouldn't be quite as quite as gnarly. I'm just going to use the tip of the soldering iron to try to uh, bend that loop out of the wire. It's kind of tricky to figure out which way they bent it when they put it in. Okay, that takes care of that. Now let's figure out where it needs to go. Well, you know, I'm just going to leave that whole piece on there. Take these long needle nose that are really handy for this type of work. Heat up the terminal. Poke it through. And we'll bend it back around and get rid of the excess. Pinch that together and we'll add some more solder back to that. You might as well just get over it now. I'm going to pronounce solder that way from now on. Because I just, I like pronouncing it that way. So, ha. That's one. I've got the next .01 in there. Solder up this terminal. Got a little bead of solder down here that uh, fell down. Here's a funny little story about one of the. I uh, um, think it was one of the Mercury uh, space missions. Might have been one of the Apollos. But anyway, they had an issue where a uh, a light was coming on, and when the astronaut would tap on the dash, the uh, <laughs> the control panel, the light would go out, and then it would come on and it turned out later they found out that it was a tiny little bead of solder that was in the switch and on the ground it was laying down in the bottom of the switch and it didn't matter but out in space in zero g it was floating around and it would intermittently short out and cause this light to come on interesting little uh anecdote there about early space program and solder I've got one here that's a 40 microfarad electrolytic. Positive is toward this tube socket. And the other one goes right here. And what they did was on the tube socket, they ran it through and then over to another terminal. So it bridges two terminals. Um, I think what I'm going to do here is clip this lead and then just uh, solder it right to the lead that I clip. So this is the positive side and I've got a little piece of the uh, spaghetti insulation left over. I think I'll just use that and I'll just put it right down there, wrap it around that wire and solder it up. Okay, I managed to get it through the uh, terminal actually. Let's get some solder on there now. takes care of that end. Okay, got the ground side on its terminal. Let's get some solder on that one. This stuff tends to um, bead up on the cluster of wires. My Kester 44 solder better than uh, the stuff that I melt off. When I melt it, it tends to just fall right off. It likes to run downhill. Something else you've got to be careful of when you do this is that you don't inadvertently short out uh, a couple of things like for instance right here between that resistor where my pliers are pointing that lead and that lead if I was to let those stay like that they're shorting out and that that uh, is not good 
So you need to make sure that all of these free leads that are floating around that are bare don't touch anything they're not supposed to touch. That's one of the tricky things about all this open uh, wiring that was done a long time ago. You gotta really watch out that nothing shorts out. The last capacitor is in there. That is that. Wow, what a difference, huh? It's a lot less crowded in there now. Now the, uh, hmm, the moment of truth. We gotta go through here again, very carefully, make sure nothing's shorting out, and then put it back into the uh, wooden frame, hook it all up, cross your fingers, hopefully everything sounds better, and I've got better separation in the left and right channels. Well, it's all connected back up in the back there. Let's let's turn it on and see what we get. Online at WNC.org. Final couple of days of the pledge drive, Keith. Still, I've got a right channel. A lot of money. Mm, just a that's not good. I don't have a left channel. Nine eight six two. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> Definitely something wrong. <laughs> Left channel doesn't sound right at all. Well, back to the workbench with it. This is plugged in right now. This is a live chassis. It's turned on. All of the power tubes have been removed. The rectifier tube is in there because I need that for my power supply. And what I'm about to do is test out plate voltages. These are the voltages that go to the plates in the tubes and they are high. They're upwards of three to four hundred volts. So unless you know what you're doing and you've got some experience with some electronics and high voltage stuff, I do not recommend you do this. If you do so, it's at your own risk. This stuff can kill you really serious stuff here so we're uh, we're not goofing around about this at all so I am going to test right now the plate voltages I've got the other hand behind my back don't touch anything that you could be a potential ground and use an insulated um, probe make sure your meter is able to handle it this meter is good for 1000 volts DC so I know I'm okay we're gonna go over to the 12 AX7 first the plates on that are on pins one and six. So let's go to pin one first and you can see on the meter what kind of voltage I have. I have to go in here really careful and make sure I don't short anything out. 394 volts. That's a lot. Now let's go over to pin six and test the other one. Ah, 402 volts. So the uh, the voltage divider resistor on there could be a little bit off on that one. It's possible those resistors I've I've read they can drift a bit. Let's go over to the uh, 12 AU7. I'll go to pin six first. It's right here. That's 404 volts. Let's go to pin one. That's the other plate. Ooh, what's going on there? That voltage is dropping off. Hmm. I've only got like two volts there for some reason. Not sure what that's all about. And let's see. Let's trace that capacitor over here. You know what? And that ends up going over to the power tube that's the left channel. Something is suspect right in here. I've got no plate voltage on one of the preamp tubes. That's a little odd. Well, let's go over to the 6BQ5 power tubes and check the plate voltage on them and that's on uh, let's see it's on pin 7 so that's 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 let's see what that voltage is 445 volts let's go over to the other one 445 volts so that's okay the 12 AX7 is okay the 12 AU7 has got a bogus voltage on one of the plates so there's the problem now we need to figure out why it's got the bad voltage on that plate alright I need to do a bit of troubleshooting but 
now I've got good capacitors in here. Something I didn't show you the first time around when I pulled out these old junkers. None of them hold a charge. They're all dead. They're all junk. Um, I gave them a quick test with the voltmeter and there's nothing there. Um, these are brand new now. Uh, the power's been on once, so before I go work on them and do any troubleshooting, or any tube amp for that matter, you're in the hundreds of volts here with the power supplies on the plates. Like the plate voltage on some of these is upwards of 300 volts. So these caps can carry some pretty serious voltages. Um, check out the voltmeter over here. I'll, uh, let's see, let's check this one. We'll put the leads across this cap. Look at that, that's carrying 137 volts. I think I may have just discharged it, I don't know, let's see. No, there it is. There's 137 volts stored in there. That would kick your ass pretty good if you were uh, to touch those two leads and the current pass through you. Depending on how it goes through your body, it could be potentially lethal. So we need to discharge those. Uh, I have here just a common household clip-on lamp. It's got a 40 watt, 120 volt bulb in it. So let me uh, disconnect it from the wall plug. I'm going to connect the voltmeter to the two leads on the plug. And I'm also going to connect a couple of jumpers with alligator clips onto the same leads. Let's lay that down here where it'll stay. Now we're going to connect this to the negative side of the chassis. I'll take this lead and connect it to one of the leads on that filter cap very carefully. And there you can see the readout, 228 volts. Now let's turn the lamp on. And you see the voltage drop off. and it drops back off. And you'll see it climb back up. That's from the meter putting a voltage back into it. So there it is. The light has discharged it. So I'll disconnect this and we'll turn that light back off. Now let's go to the, uh, the next lead. That one's right here. There's a resistor between the two but you can see there's a little 5 volts is really nothing to worry about. So let's do this again. Turn the lamp off. Now let's go to the final third lead that's on here. And looks like there's only about three volts in there. I'm going to discharge that. So where do we start? Well we should probably start by testing the resistor that uh, feeds the voltage to that plate and that resistor is right there. There's one over here on the other plate. It's the same value resistor. Uh, let's see, let me look on my schematic here and see what that is. Well, I've desoldered both of those. They're both uh, supposed to be 47K. That's 47,000 ohms. And um, they come from the same source voltage and they lead to the two plates in the 12AU7. Let's test the, uh, the, the one that is good first and sure enough it's reading uh, 50.9 K so that's within a decent enough tolerance I suppose let's uh, let's check the other one that's suspect it's reading absolutely nothing so this has this has no conductivity whatsoever so that's needing to be replaced how about that we actually found one of our problems I've got uh, some of the circuit boards here from the old Wurlitzer organ that I salvaged. I chucked the rest of it, tore everything down because I didn't have room for that organ here at my house and I figured I could use the parts a lot more than the organ. It had a few little issues anyway. And uh, this is from roughly the same era as the old Zenith. Um, I got that Wurlitzer in the, the same pile of electronics I got the Zenith from. So as I search around through here and look for a 47K, which is yellow, purple, orange, I found one right there where my uh, players are. And not only did I find one, I found one with a silver fourth band. 
which uh, has a 10% tolerance. So that's good. So let's see if we can find another one and we'll just go ahead and replace both of those. A quickie little demo here of just how uh, different resistors can be from one to the other even though they may be marked the same. Now this is supposed to be a 47K resistor and that one looks pretty good. That's 56.3K. That's not bad. Let's check this other one I found. And that, that one's 68. So you can see it, it's worth testing them when you salvage them. So let's get rid of that one and search for another. Well, I salvaged, let's see, four of them and they range anywhere from 51 to um, 58K. So they need to be 47K. This one is 51.8. The one that's in the circuit that works okay is 51.1 so I'm just gonna put the 51.8 in on the uh, side that wasn't working and test again I'm just gonna splice this one into the old lead I just put a loop on each end and crimped them together with some pliers and now I'll just add some solder to that joint And we'll just do the same on the other side here. I decided to go ahead and change the, uh, the two supply uh, voltage resistors for the 12AX7 also. Um, let's see, let's measure the old ones. 114k on that one. Let's check the other one. What the hell? 290k. Isn't it amazing how much these things can drift? It kind of makes me wonder how many other resistors in this thing have drifted that far. Well, at any rate, let's uh, test the voltages at the plates again on those two tubes and see what we got. All hooked back up to power. Chassis hot. Rectifier tube is all warmed up. Let's check those plate voltages again. We'll start out with the 12 AX7. Let's go to pin 1. 409 volts. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Let's go over here to the other one. 409 volts. I love it. They were quite a bit different before. Now we'll go over to the 12AU7. Let's go to pin 1, the one that was giving us trouble before. 411 volts. Pin 6. 411 volts. Nice. Nicely balanced. I like it. I like it. I like it a lot. Okay, let's check one more time the 6BQ5. 448, 448, also balanced, nice. Good deal, let's put the tubes back in and connect it up and see what kind of sound we have now. Been quite a journey to get to this point. So uh, now that we've got plate voltages on all the tubes, let's give it a try. Power on, got it on the uh, tuner first. Let it warm up. That's what I love about tubes. You have to let them warm up. Oh, yeah. Well, let's check the separation. I got uh, the right channel. Channel, it's actually got stereo separation again. Awesome. Let's check out the phono back on that old uh, cha cha record from the previous video. And we'll have some comparison here, see how we sound now. Oops, would help if I turned up the volume, I suppose. Better. I'm actually 
so they got stereo imaging left and right now. Yes! Awesome, now that the electronic stuff is out of the way, we can get after the woodworking, which is basically just get after this with a random orbital sander, get this finish off, and um, give it a coat of stain, something close to this, give it a clear coat, good to go! Let's move it out to the garage and get to work on that. Okay, let's get after it. Started out with 60, went to 80, 120, and now I'm finishing up with some 220. And they'll be ready for stain. I've done a few test pieces here with some various stains and I think I'm going to go with this. It's uh, fairly close to everything else on here. Um, yeah, it's not bad. It's close enough because it's just for the top. I'm going to tape off the uh, edges just to keep things uh, neater, cleaner as I work because I'm going to also put some uh, clear polyurethane on this when I'm all done. Let that sit a few minutes and uh, wipe off the excess and it will be nicely stained. Okay, let's wipe off the excess now. Oh, that looks great. Oh, that's not bad. I like it. We're ready for clear coat. Got this open so that I can go right to the edges and not drip down into the tuner if it was to hit the edge of the lid. When you're putting this on with a brush, just um, like painting, don't be afraid to be liberal with the amount you put on. The biggest mistake people make with varnishing and painting is not actually getting enough on the surface. Looks great. It's all uh, dried down on the top and I really like the grain that showed up underneath all that veneer fake stuff. That looks pretty good. We're just about ready to get it in the house and set it up for a, a little party we're having tonight. Um, I gotta get the back put on here. I've got it sitting here with the screws. But there's one more thing I've got to show you down in here on the uh, on the chassis. I didn't show it to you when I was on the workbench. So let's um, Let's get the camera up in here, dive inside, get some light on here. And I want you to see something on the chassis. See that right there? See that date? 11-10-59. My birthday is 11-30-59. This thing is 20 days older than me. Ha! How about that? Okay, let's get the back on and get it in the house. Well, the party is happening and the old Zenith is rocking out the Beatles. Doing a great job. It sounds great. More of the uh, last of the Red Hot Cha-Cha's. We had this playing last night at a party we had here. Uh, had a little wine soiree, had a dozen or so people over and lots of people really loved the fact that this really cool little piece of vintage electronics was still working fine and reminded them of some similar units that they had when they were growing up in their household. So it's pretty cool to have it all up and running again and everything fixed. The left-right separation of the stereo is really good. The bass response is a lot better. The trebles are just crisper and cleaner. Recapping that thing really helped a lot. That and balancing out the uh, plate voltages on the tubes also helped. 
I will probably get into the FM tuner sometime and recap that and check plate voltages on all the tubes there just to make sure everything's good and to prevent any possible meltdowns of capacitors in there that could cause a fire, which would really be not good because this thing is in such great shape I'd like to keep it that way. So that'll be in an upcoming episode sometime down the road a ways. But for now, it's it's good as is, and I'm sure we will put it to use listening to my old vinyl collection for the first time in years. So I hope you enjoyed this video series, and be sure to uh, keep on watching. If you like the stuff you see, don't forget to donate. It's on the web page. Just click the donate link and throw a little money my way. Until next time. I'm just going to splice this transistor through the transistor. That's a resistor, dumbass.